education is the best way to understand uh, management of practice, and that's why we're here. The first part of the session, I'm going to talk about what it is, because unless you understand how complex it is, you can't devise learning programs, because without the background knowledge of the complexities, you're shooting in the dark. It's all got a dovetail to take into consideration the complexities of the syndrome. And we took the snapshot to just explain privately the syndrome. And it says it so beautifully because it explains the multiple systems, but it also explains that with support, they have got some incredible contributions to make to this world. And I watch with great pride to see what my son has achieved with what is an incredibly complex disability. 101 Prada Willi Syndrome, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but 101 Basics, it's random. Chromosome 15 is the culprit. We know a lot about it. Our geneticists have really given us almost too much knowledge about it. We are drowning in knowledge about chromosome 15. It's a condition you're born with and continues right through life. There's no medication, there's no surgery. It is down to management strategies alone. It's equal across male and female. It's <coughs> ratio of occurrence puts it in the rare syndrome uh, category. I have seen figures from 15,000. I suggest it's probably a tad higher. Other countries, it's up to 1 in 25. I think that's more to do with all the kept records and everything else. That's the chromosome to blame. That's the guilty party. And, oh, they know so much about it. And it's uh, a king, and they describe like a bushfire going through a chromosome. It doesn't take out all of the chromosome. It's like a wildfire. It takes a house here, a house there. It's quite random. But where that deletion occurs is the effect that that person is going to carry with them through life. So you can see now that no two people with Prader-Willi syndrome are going to be exactly alike. There's enough common characteristics, but they're never exactly the same. Prader-Willi is just one part of who that person is. It doesn't define who they are in total. But people have different uh, experiences in family life, socioeconomic life, uh, educational experiences. Some of our children travel widely, and they are incredibly, their general knowledge is amazing what they have achieved because their families out and about all over the place, but their experiences are quite different to the family that gets very isolated. So each person comes up very differently. We see a great deal of information from our geneticists who tell us that the hypothalamus is core to the problem. And the hypothalamus is the self-regulating part of our brain. And it is such a critical part in regulating so many of our <coughs> body systems. So when I go through what probably syndrome affects, it affects every major system in the body the endocrine system, the digestive system, cognitive development, muscular system, respiratory system, I could keep going on and on. Every major system is affected. And then just to throw the muscular part, of course, to keep fit and healthy, the actual muscular system in itself is impaired right down to mitochondria level. So here we are. I've got a picture exercising, except we'll give you a set of muscles that make exercising problematic. It's a real complex disability. Here's a snapshot. This is what greets you quite early in the piece when you get told the news about cardiac <coughs> Again, there's a lot of variance in that too. It's a very much a um, thumbnail description of Prader-Willi syndrome. 
huge variance within that description. I reckon that bottom one. I reckon that's a common denominator that comes up quite often. Now I'm going to speak a little bit about the cognitive processes and central processing characteristics of probability syndrome because that's the core uh, purpose in schooling. And learning is an evolving, ever-changing <laughs> process. But I think it's important to just have an understanding of what probability syndrome uh, characteristics look like in cognitive development and processing. When you see that list, uh, it really makes you realise how compromised their whole learning process is because when you look at their ability to pick up new tasks, they take a lot of time to scaffold. You've got to have the consolidation scaffolding uh, structures in place. Uh, I'm talk, and when I talk scaffolding, I mean supporting a new learning uh, skill. It's got to be left in place much, much longer. Look, I think I've dealt with every major disability group, and I would say probably a syndrome. Uh, I erred on the side of caution and left support in place for a lot longer before I was confident that that new learning skill had been embedded into long-term memory. I'd say way longer than ID, way longer than mainstream autism spectrum disorder. It needs a longer consolidation period. So when we say slowness in learning, that has huge ramifications in the classroom. It's long-term memory is fantastic. Short-term memory, well, uh, three unit memories is comfortable. Uh, and I would say even at the end of secondary school, my son got no more than four unit memories. <laughs> Everything had to be chunked in very short pieces of information at a time, and then consolidated and consolidated and consolidated. Case in point, um, the future tense, we had speech therapy from 11 months to 17 years. He got the future tense and was able to use it in day-to-day -day conversation when he was 16. I never gave up. He saw his world <laughs> in present and past uh, up to then, and he just had to assume that when he was talking present, and sometimes he's referring to the future. But who had to do all the work with that? The listener. Very concrete thinkers, very visual. The doing is important. We're talking about the planning skills, the higher thinking skills, the ability to draw inference, the analytic skills. They are incredibly impaired. Particularly as we get past grade three, we assume quite a lot of metacognitive processing skills. You cannot assume that. So what you do, you tailor your teaching around that <coughs> support. And visually supporting it is the best way. It's really important to understand that when you stand in front of the child with probability syndrome, their cognitive processing skills are not going to be the same as someone with ID or which is they're quite separate. I think it's really, it's crucial that if you've got a child coming into the school who may have Prader-Willi syndrome, it's, it's vital that all staff are informed because that child belongs to the whole school. He or she is not just a child in a classroom, but part of our whole school community and we need to know how to best cater for that child and his or her needs. Now the other thing that challenges us is we assume that when we're taught something in one situation that it's transferred to all other similar situations. Yes, it. If you've taught something in the classroom in a very structured way, which we, is how we introduce things formally, and then we expect the children to transfer them to other situations. And it's not just in learning tasks, it's also social skills, emotional 
uh, relationship skills. Do not assume this was probably single. Their transfer ability is actually quite impaired. So often, if uh, you go down to music, or you go down to phys <laughs> ed, or you go down to um, the ESL classes, they're tearing their hair out. Hold on, the classroom teacher said they're able to do A, B, C, and D. Why isn't it happening down here? Okay, it's a different routine. It's a different set of language you're using. There are different um, uh, expectations with the second language. Um, <coughs> quite different. So don't assume transfer from situation A to situation B. If it happens, you're at stake, <coughs> but don't assume it. The concept of time is very much tied up with the lack of planning and organisation, medical, medical cognitive planning. They get lost in the moment. They can, they seem to be, uh, once they're on a task, stuck in that task. And it's actually a um, cognitive functioning uh, fault where we prompt, our brain prompts us to move on to the next job, right? We're finished doing our maths, we're going to now get them for art, we are going to now start um, our individual learning um, task. They're stuck, they've got to have an external prompt to move them on to that next task. It's not that they're being disobedient, it's not that they're being, uh, not wanting to do the next task, it's much more complicated than that. They literally are stuck on that point. And to get to the next task, you've got to be the prompt. Now, often it's a timer, often it's a signal. I'm great on signals. A few words, lots of signals. Uh, move them on. You are giving them that, that cue to move on. They appreciate that prompt. They want assistance. They can't do it themselves. They look silly if everyone else is down on the floor doing their counting work and they're back at the table doing the previous task. Once that happens, anxiety starts to increase and the behaviours start to escalate. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about IQ. We, we are absolutely bogged down with IQ. <laughs> I, if I had my way, I, I used to get all the results back when I was doing the integration coordination. And at one stage, I had 16 children on the integration program, and all their reports would come in, uh, and top of the pile would be their risk assessment. And that, for some, defined everything that that child could do. I found them more of a hindrance than a help particularly in the case of Prader-Willi syndrome because our children actually do quite well on some of the subtests in the risk. Uh, uh, you all familiar with the risk assessment that they use for IQ assessment? Our kids actually do quite well. It actually elevates their, their scores and in some cases it's um, not to their advantage at all. In fact, it disadvantages them because it, scores them at a level, yeah, they put in certain subtests, but they're only the pattern sorting, the scatter diagrams, they're quite specific tests. And for some reason, they have made them a compulsory component of the risk assessment. Even though I personally have written quite a lengthy explanation as to why other subtests should be used for priority syndrome. <coughs> it doesn't give a good indication of where our children are at cognitively. Not that they, that assessment should be the be and end all that drives our teaching, but often drive, drives the resources with it. Now, you would expect often better performance than what that they be but what they are doing is presenting exactly where they're at. So don't be swayed by um, a lot of the formal assessments that have been done. Use your own judgment and trust your own judgment. Uh, this one in, and it's one I usually use for um, the early intervention sessions I do, but I want to put in just have an understanding of the delays. <laughs> 
in the milestones for Proud of the Syndrome. They have a perfectly useful milestone development schedule, but it's not akin to what a milestone is for a child without, dis without Proud of the Syndrome. So I used to say, okay, the sentence has only started coming, oh, a year or two before the um, hit you with Kinder. So they've taken a long time to develop those uh, milestones. So don't expect things to accelerate just because they're at school or just because they're at Kinder. They are on their own Proud of Willy Syndrome milestone development scale. A little bit of time on the speech and language because with relationships, social skills, interactions, mm -hmm. we use our language for, I think there's something like 16 main purposes for language. In our day-to-day -day existence, we use it for 16 purposes. Now, if you have got language delay, or in some cases it's dyspraxia, dysphasia. In just about all cases, it's a receptive language deficit. Imagine the impact that has not on your learning, just in the classroom, your social development, your emotional development. In fact, how you see the entire world, how you can express your feelings, how you can ask for assistance, how you can get more knowledge. We use language for far more purposes than just an exchange of ideas. Much more complex. And I would say just about every single person with Prada Willy syndrome at some point of their life is going to have language communication difficulties. That's one that's almost across the board with behaviour. Now, it's the realm of a speech therapist to be critically involved in uh, children with Prada Willy syndrome. They may drift in and drift out, but their overall guidance are, look, we kept the same speech pathologist for 20 years. She became more of a friend than a speech pathologist after all that time. But we used her for social skills development, for pragmatic um, interactions. When he went into the workforce, we got her back in to work with the employers. We have used a speech therapist, her and our dietitian. They've got halos. Quite a few difficulties. Uh, uh, again, this doesn't apply to every single child. And you will be sitting here right now saying, yes, no, yes, no. So you will take away from that where your particular uh, emphasis has got to be. <coughs> I would say our dyspraxia, dysphasia, uh, caused huge implications for social interactions and relationships. Uh, others have no problem with their articulation. They will talk the leg off an iron pot and back on again. Not a lot of substance to what they say. And without exception, their receptive language <laughs> is very impaired. But there's definitely nothing the matter with the delivery of their speech. <laughs> In fact, there's no stop button. They'll talk and talk and talk and talk. You'll walk to the front door. Uh, and you, they wouldn't know you from a bar of soap, you've just walked in for a session, and right in your ear, and they'll be talk, 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 and I said, I know exactly what you're doing, you're anxious, why are you here? Uh, the anxiety takes over with the language just flowing, and until we've sat down and talked about why I'm here, <laughs> what we're doing, how it's going to help, you can see the anxiety going, and then the, the incessant talking will slow down. But the talking may be a lot of articulation, but often it's um, a lot of uh, story behind how it's delivered. Now this is the, I thought I'd put this in because in the playground, 
Uh, we assume a lot of um, physical skills, a lot of agility, a lot of um, skills with games and what have we. But when you have a look at the physical characteristics of someone with Prader-Willi syndrome, even that puts them at a disadvantage. Uh, sure, small hands uh, with ball games and what have we, not a big major disadvantage, but it is a disadvantage. But when you put that alongside all the other things they're dealing with, it's just one more thing to add to their challenge in the playground. Their coordination, their balance, uh, again, a physiotherapist, exercise physiologist. Ah, and I discovered an exercise nurse when I was in a respiratory at the Royal Melbourne the other day. Uh, all the input you can get into helping them get the best possible uh, performance out of what they've got. And it takes time and it takes a lot of input from other people. Now, we're going to now get to, on the ground, how do we, how do, we do the best delivery of program possible. And this was actually one adjusted from what I used to do when I do training for teaching for specialised learning programs. And some would say, OK, look, you know, we do this. We know what you're talking about here. And I'd say, well, actually, when I go in the classroom, I don't see this happening at all. It's something you think you all do, but when you really look at what's happening on the ground, it's not always the case because we get so buried in what single outcome we're trying to achieve and make better. We focus on that. With Prader-Willi syndrome, these three are so intertwined and so one will affect the other. And at times you'll need to support the other areas as well. You may be focusing on a well-being issue like social skills and training, but without <laughs> fail, uh, there'll be a change in behaviour. You'll probably get the anxiety up if there's skin picking problems or if there's some more of the outbursts that occur in more frequency. You will have that effect in other areas. So I say, when you introduce a change of a routine, be very, very aware that will have ramifications in other areas. And supports may need to be increased, not just on that little outcome you're working with. You might have to look at the whole picture and see what other supports need to be put in place. Probably self-injurious behaviours happen in a very high percentage of our Prader-Willi syndrome children. What does it mean we talk about social skills training? And this is not... <coughs> this is Kate's survey of the ones that she goes to see. I always ask them, what, what's really important to you? And this is a summary of the things that they felt. This is children, adults, teenagers, of what was important to them. And I, they'll mention exercise. It's amazing. They really do understand how important exercise is to their life. The pet, um, but the ones I've highlighted are the ones that really uh, are focusing on. It all basically fits in those categories of what they want and that safe, secured, I want to be safe. They'll say that, I want to be safe. And what they're saying is food access, food security monitored. It's a load off their shoulders when they've got confidence that someone is managing what they can't manage. <coughs> so this is the duty of care. And I think everyone who is working with someone with Prader-Willi syndrome should have this basic understanding. Two important things there. The importance of reducing access to food to prevent obesity and keeping food intake to strict levels as suggested by dietitian is the goal. The second one we sometimes forget people with Prader-Willi syndrome are going to get all the other illnesses that you and I get, plus 
the bucket load of other things that come with Prada Willi syndrome. So don't forget that either. Everything's put down to Prada Willi syndrome. It's a lot of other things that happen in life too. So just imagine the, if they're not present now, <laughs> some of them are, are waiting around the corner and medical care is absolutely paramount. We've got to remember people with Prada Willi syndrome because of the damage to the hypothalamus are unable to regulate their own health and well-being. They are reliant on those around who are supporting them to do that for them. So they are dependent on your eyes and your ears to pick up on the indicators of poor health. And the more you know the child or the adult, or you will be very, very in tune to when they're unwell. Cut off his finger myself and put a band-aid on it. Because the pain threshold so high. The pain threshold is high because the messages that go to the hypothalamus to tell them that they're in pain are so weak. The message doesn't get there. It's such a weak message. The same for the appetite. They may have had a full meal, but the message that goes from the stomach to the brain is so weak, it's not registered. So it's not that the mechanism isn't there to regulate temperature, pain, appetite. It's there, but the neurotransmitters that send it along its way send a message that's so weak it's not registered. So they might know they're unwell, some vague feeling of unwellness, but no idea. Oh, might be appendicitis. They might feel not well in some cases. Oh, yeah, well, your appendicitis, your appendix are about to burst. That's why you're feeling unwell. Oh, you've just severed your finger. That's why it's a little bit upsetting. Ah, oh, your eardrums burst. So there might be a sense of unwellness, but they couldn't communicate, uh, particularly if it's internal, exactly where that is. So you are the monitor of their good health. They might bruise, and they bruise really easily, but they will have no idea where that injury occurred. We've had two weeks on a broken leg before we got it <laughs> plastered. It's amazing, amazing. Yeah, I'll put this hand out in your folder and I think it should be on the file uh, if there's ever an ambulance call for any incidents or whatever that should go with them to hospital along with uh, a booklet because in emergency they are way too busy uh, to get to their computer but if you can thrust the page in front of them and say well this is the story for Prada Willi syndrome uh, this is what we need you to be aware of. You can short circuit a lot of major medical catastrophes. Do not hesitate to call triple zero. Don't hesitate at all. Uh, the temperature abnormalities, uh, they're unable to regulate their own temperature. Again, the story, the messages that go to the brain to tell them that it's like 40 degrees and the fact you're wearing three jumpers could be a little bit out of kilter or the fact that it is one degree and you're wearing shorts and a t-shirt a little bit incorrect so they are again the person around them supporting <coughs> them is the one that prompts them to what's the correct attire but again if we get a temperature we feel hot and clammy we feel unwell <coughs> again they don't register that uh, sleep issues uh, our children are virtually sleep deprived. Most of their waking day, they sleep, their sleep pattern is disturbed and the majority will have a disturbed sleep pattern and high fatigue level. Throw that into the mix with everything else. Imagine how you feel if you're permanently sleep deprived. Imagine how you feel if you're dealing with all these other things that we have talked about. And if you put yourself in their shoes and imagine how you'd feel, 
you'd be starting to get some idea of what each day is like. Right, now this will be a handout for you to, to put on file and it should be on the front uh, if it ever needs to be dealt with and anyone who's working with Evie should know, should be familiar with these because uh, duty of care is really, really important. Now I'm going to do a little, only a small bit on behaviours because that is directly related to the social skills. When we come to formal education, the parameters and the rules that we expect change and we have a lot more conformity to what society expects normal behaviour to be. Now I just want you to have a look at that list of typical Proud of Willie <laughs> syndrome behaviours. It's not exactly conducive to harmony <laughs> in a situation. In fact, it's quite, <clears throat> quite a conglomerate of behaviours that even one takes a lot of addressing and often it comes in multiples. But believe you me, with very firm fair and concise, consistent management, it can be done. Now, a lot of the behaviours have been related to the autistic spectrum. Some don't. There are some people I've met with Proud of Willis Syndrome who definitely don't fit that profile. But there is a significant proportion that do fit that profile. And a lot of the strategies I use in my teaching with the autistic spectrum children are used with Proud of Willis syndrome because the child I was working with did have autistic tendencies or autistic like behaviours I prefer to call it. Now the geneticists are telling us more and more that um, chromosome 15 is definitely going to come to play to explain Proud of Willis syndrome, uh, autistic spectrum but it's going to be not just one gene, it's going to be several genes that all interplay for autistic spectrum. Now, chromosome 15 definitely has some of the behaviours, the hoarding, but it's subtly different hoarding. Uh, the obsessions, there are similarities and again know your child you will know if that's relevant. <coughs> Our children's high anxiety levels are due to the genetic deletion. We sit here and our anxiety levels are base level. You are under control with your anxiety. It's firmly sitting very relaxed, very comfortable. Anxiety is very low level. <clears throat> Our children wake up each morning, not down here, halfway up the pyramid. It's actually a volcano ready to erupt. Our children are highly anxious children. They wake up highly anxious. They're very bad at predicting what's going to happen, but they want to control what's happening. They are also dependent on routine for making sense of their life. They operate under a very strict routine. It doesn't take much to get to <coughs> frustration if you're high up that pyramid. And there's, um, I reckon there's milliseconds sometimes that go to the anger and temper. And the proud of the temper, ah, oh, it's to be seen, to be believed. It's a work of art. See many of them. <laughs> and you just detach and you understand it's a part of the syndrome because you're controlling that anxiety. Bringing that anxiety to a manageable level where they can get on with the rest of their life. The main triggers that set off behaviours and anxiety. Now if you can have an insight running as to what is going to change that behaviour you are a step ahead and you can do something about it before you have an eruption. Without, yeah, but I'll back to step 
people, when we have the sessions, they'll say, Kate, but it comes out of the blue and nothing triggers it. And I'll, I'll disagree wholeheartedly because at some point something has triggered that behaviour. The behaviour's there for a reason. It's a result of high anxiety levels. It may not have been in the exact situation. That's why so often we cop it at home because they'll hold it together until they get to home and then you'll get the full brunt. And if you're not in the word of what's happened at school, you're feeling blind. The triggers will be there. It may not be that exact second, or it may not even be at that place. It may not be uh, as straightforward as you think because some of the ways that Prader-Willi syndrome people can construe facts has to be seen to be believed. They try and join dots to make sense of a situation but sometimes the dots they join are just totally incorrect and they'll go down a path that's totally misread a situation. So you have got to almost be able to preempt <laughs> when their illogical thought patterns are going and bring them back to explain that that was not the cause why this has happened. Again, a lot of knowledge of the person involved and a lot of um, skills. No use having just one or two things. You've got to have a toolbox of distractors. Humour and the ridiculous works best. You can do the most ridiculous... And they look at you as if to say, what are you doing? And that'll often be enough to stop that escalation. Um, Again, that takes knowing the person very well to pull that off. <laughs> you don't look the best in public. You look quite ridiculous at times, but do you know what? I don't really care. I'm dealing with the problem and I'll deal with it best I can. All right, without fail, it'll be one of those four things that'll set off behaviours. <laughs> the lack of food security is usually up there and that ability to secure a food environment and have that take second place to everything else is a skill. Even the smell is enough to trigger that part of the brain. We also have needed in regard to um, our little fellow with Prader-Willi syndrome to change the eating behaviours of the children across the school. So rather than everybody going out and having their lunch outdoors and perhaps leaving their food and running off and having a play and coming back and finishing their food, we all make sure that we eat food inside which is great because then we get to talk with, you know, the teachers get to talk to the children about the health aspect of what they're eating and they're able to even more closely monitor what the children are eating. Um, but it's important that our child with Prada Willy is kept safe in regard to the amount of food that is around the school. So we have changed our eating behaviours. All children eat inside, no food is taken outside so that there, it, there isn't the temptation for him in this case. Before you move on, can you please fix that first word? What? What is missing from that first word? What? It was at the start of the sentence. What should it have? So many of the problems come back to communication issues. You've really got to understand that Everyone's got to be on the same page and understanding, talking to the person with Prada willi syndrome, receptive language is down, so short, sharp and to the point is the way to go. Some little hints to help with that communication. It really makes a difference. Uh, the visual hand signals, use them all the time. Stop. Uh, Three more, when they talk on incessantly about the same thing over and over again. A simple thing. You can, that means uh, you can tell me three more things about it, but after that, no more. And they know. You've got three things you're allowed to tell me. That's the end. Voice down. Uh, I need some space. 
uh, I'm busy with another child. Often it's this one. Mm. <laughs> Stop. Mm. Cool down. And those signals send really powerful messages. And if you're in a heightened state of anxiety, mm. you can't process words, but those signals are very clear and will tell you exactly what you want them to know. <laughs> Always double check too. Just check back that they've actually understood what you've asked them. Because so often they haven't understood. And they're not being naughty or disrespectful or um, pressing your buttons. They, lit they haven't understood what you wanted them to do. So always go back and double check you've got that message across. And that often stops a lot of um, behaviours dead in a track. Because you'll see then they're joining dots that are going in the complete opposite direction than you want them to go. Active listening. You can, in a classroom, you're surrounded by children and everyone's talking, chatting. And we are notoriously bad at zeroing in on certain facts. We are trying to get the global coverage of a classroom. And the fact that active listening and until I really became aware of what a difference that makes. It's, you're concentrating not just with your ears, but with your eyes and body language. You are taking the whole message in. You are really focusing on a lot more than just words. It's often not what is said, it's what's not said that's important. And if you're actively listening to the child with prader willi syndrome, you can start to pick up on some of those triggers that may not have been in the place where you're working, but might be somewhere else, might be at home, might be wherever. But you can pick up on some of the things that are causing the anxiety. But active listening picks up signs of pain, it picks up signs of anxiety, it picks up the sign that they are aiming for bigger and better manipulation. I'm a great believer that active listening really curtails a lot of long-term behaviour explosions. The clear, concise, consistent communication, if you take that away, that's really important. Consistency is the key. Hot and cold doesn't work with our kids. All they see is, I can manipulate this, and boy, do they manipulate. They are absolute magicians at manipulating people. And they do it so smoothly. It's amazing. Your goal is to encourage words, not actions. You, you don't want the wall being hit in. You don't, and I've seen some wonderful explosions. They are the best two-year-old tantrums on record. And that's all they are. There's nothing complicated about these behaviours. They're tantrums. Pure and simple tantrums. So you're wanting words, not actions. You have a lot of diversions. I had a toolbox of things that you'd pull out. Sounds so stupid, but some... I used to just grab a pair of ultra-big glasses and put them on. Now, what is the problem here? And I think, what is she doing? It's something as simple as that. Or you do the unexpected. And look, simple things like you just twirl around and say, well, what was that were you going to do? Simple distractors. You are purely distracting and you're doing something unexpected. Rehearsal strategies, never in the moment of the temper explosion do you start to sit down and talk about alternative behaviour. <laughs> Wasting your time. You do that in the quiet moments after. And you put rehearsal strategies in place and you actually rehearse stock standard phrases for them to use. You'll have to do it often, but it's very, very useful if they have 
hidden away a strategy that can get them out of a the problem. They hate, they are so remorseful after an outburst. They don't like it. Our kids want to be a part of a group. They want to be valued. They want, remember we talked about what they thought was important with their well-being, But they just don't know how to do it. And often they do it so badly. <laughs> So absolutely, clumsily, they wade through social groups. They have a lot of difficulty initiating and maintaining friendships. And yet each of us wish no more than to have a best friend. So what you are wanting to do is to make your support translate to daily activities. That's, that's what you are aiming to do. Just a few little do's and don'ts here. The first is, <clears throat> don't try and generalise, right, that's what your peers are doing, that's how they interact, look, that's how well they do it, look, they're happily playing. Don't try and generalise their achievements and social skills with the person with Prada Willi syndrome. They do not translate well. Uh, much more complex uh, a process for getting those seamless skills. And when you watch children in the playground, it's quite seamless. They play happily, go from one group to another, and have a lovely time. Now, that generalisation just doesn't translate well for our children. So you're better to say, right, we're dealing with who you are and this is what's needed for you. So it's very much an individualised program. The playground has to be the most challenging place for someone with Prada Willi syndrome. You go outside and it's ever changing, friendships are fluid, the games the rules that go with games can change from morning playtime to lunchtime. The other kids keep up with those changes. Our kids don't. They uh, can mix and match. Oh, I don't want to play with you. Just this moment, I'm playing with someone else. No, that's change. Now, all those things, the unpredictability, the fluid nature of playing, all of that is unpredictable, not to routine, and out of my control. The three things that people with Prada Willi syndrome find most challenging. So that is the environment they're going to have to learn to cope with. All the things that they do badly, they're going to have to be supported to gradually move into using appropriate words and actions. I think it's always important, and I've always been very upfront and open with the children who are playing with the children with Prada Willi syndrome. I've encouraged the children themselves to be open. Again, this is very much a school decision, a parent decision, uh, most importantly, the child's decision too, how they want to deal with it. But it often helps if they know that they're supported by those around them. And I always uh, explained it, and with the person who had Prada Willi syndrome, that it was like a seizure when the temper tantrums happened. They're explosive, they're not pretty, and the fallout is very unpleasant <coughs> for all those around them. There's no point waxing lyrical, it's the reality. Always explained it, it's a seizure. It's beyond their control and it comes and it goes. And that's the understanding you take. And as our duty of care with an epileptic, you provide a safe, cool down environment where they can get themselves ready to join the group again. The fact was their behaviour was, when they get to that point, is out of their control. Oh. I'm putting together a program. The speech pathologist has got to be up front and central 
with this program, uh, whether it's by phone advice, whether it's uh, emailing, whether they're here on site. The speech pathologist is the person most qualified to implement something as embraceive as that because you're dealing with receptive, expressive and pragmatic language <coughs> skills. So often the weaknesses are in all three areas, particularly the pragmatic language skills. And out in the playground, you need all three. In the classroom, you need all three. I've divided it into areas, and they're the focus areas. My advice would be not to try and do it all at once. It would be overwhelming. I would tackle the one that you see most in need. A speech pathologist will have lots of ideas on how to bring it into the daily program. The conversational skills, we're not talking about artic, we're not talking about semantics. We are talking how to have a conversation. Now, all of these things, personal space, our kids are up close and personal, their volume is often too loud, they've got very low awareness of uh, how other people feel, they're, empath they're not empathetic at all. Uh, if I don't understand something, how do I even ask someone to explain what I don't understand? Often it's as basic as that. Often they need to rehearse how to say, I didn't get that. I don't understand what you're talking about. I just don't know. They'll say nothing. Or worse off, they'll agree with you. Our kids want to keep you happy. So they will say, is that all right? Is that OK? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Really, they have got no idea what you wanted them to do. No understanding at all. But they didn't have the skills to say, I have got no idea what you want me to do next. I have got no idea how I'm going to solve this problem. <coughs> they can't even ask that question. So. That's a really good one to start with, how to ask for help. Uh, topic maintenance. Oh, yes, that's a big one. You might be having a heart-to-heart -heart about common denominators or some decimal places. You'll hear about the football results. Nothing to do with what you're talking about in class. And I'll come from left field with the most in aim topics that you wonder where on earth it's come from. Topic maintenance is a huge problem for our kids. So those skills are something that all need to be worked on. Not over weeks, not over months, over years. I'll go even further, over decades. So it's a lifelong journey. The strategies I found really useful you'll find any more. They're even more useful. What works for you, you do. Now, the co cooperative game schools are found phys ed and uh, if they're in after school programs or in sporting programs are really good for getting that sense of cooperation. They are so busy coping with the load they're carrying. Their empathy probably extends a centimetre either side of their body. They're very, they've got so much to deal with to just cope with each minute of each day. Their ability to relate to those around them, or their pragmatic skills that would allow them to relate to those around them, are sadly lacking. And their interest is very much what's happening to them and them alone. There's nothing like structured games where they're supported. There's nothing like uh, small group skill sessions uh, where they just learn how to catch. They take a lot longer to get those gross motor skills, to kick a football, to uh, get a bat. Uh, I ran handball, I ran tournaments every day, every lunchtime. 
But it was just, you were out there with them, we had round robins every lunchtime, and that was structured, there was turn taking, there was learning how to win and lose, there was learning a skill that you could actually transfer to lots of other situations with support. This is the biggest challenge of all. And it's got to be done so empathetically. It's got to be done so tactfully. And it's got to be done with everyone speaking the same language. How to get someone's attention and to break into a group in a positive way. Not showing off not doing something that's unacceptable, but breaking into a group in an acceptable way. That takes a lot of support to achieve that. But boy, it's a useful skill to take with you. Because one of the things we are assuming comes easily for our children, don't. I've got to be supported, I've got to be nurtured, it's got to be scaffolded and consolidated over and over and over again. And then you have school holidays and it's lost <laughs> and you start again. Sharing a friend, uh, if you watch the playground, it's so fluid. <laughs> friends come, friends go, we'll go off and do that. You go and have a drink and they've all gone off. Um, go to the toilet, you're left behind, what do you do? Most kids will just go and join another group. Our, our kids get frazzled. The anxiety rises and the behaviour is kicking and the behaviour is often inappropriate. And does that actually warm themselves to their peers? No. It's counterproductive. But when you understand why the behaviours are happening, it all makes a lot of sense. That reaction to anxiety overrides everything. And it's keeping that anxiety level low. That's when you make your big gains. Sometimes when they do a form of friendship, it's almost an obsessive friendship. And they stick to them like glue, to the point where it's almost suffocating. And then when they're away, or if they go on a holiday, they have got no way of coping at all. So they'll either match up with the teacher on duty or just behaviours will be all over the place. So that's, what do you do when your friend's not there? What do you do if they're away on holidays for a length of time? So you've got to have all those supports in place to have them practised and rehearsed. It's no good doing it when they've gone, but if you know someone's off on an extended holiday, you start those supports long before they've gone. Our children are notoriously bad at recognising their feelings. Uh, even recognising the impact their anger has had on those around them and themselves. Their empathy with others is only, I think, equaled by their lack of understanding of how much it upsets them. After an incident, they are truly remorseful. They are beside themselves with despair of what they've done. And they often cry unconsolably after a temper tantrum. Conflict management, uh, yeah, it's incredibly difficult. And again, rehearsal is the best way to do it. And modelling how you behave. I mean, you go through uh, how you feel after something's happened and just how we're going to resolve it. And you are going to be working together. So that relationship, in some sense, has got to be repaired and restored because you're moving forward together. And I probably ended up formalising that. And it had two purposes. The first purpose was to actually document what happened, which you could do for duty of care. The other purpose was to get a sense of frequency, uh, and you got a, 
an idea of when the events were happening so you could get the triggers so you could manage it a bit better. So um, it gave you a dual, gave you some data to work from to inform your next teaching strategies. But also gave that repairing, um, being new, you could sit down and say, well, you know, that made me really unhappy. I felt really miserable when you, you know, you get a C and D. And how did you feel? Again, putting that message back, how did you feel and how are we going to move forward? It's always moving forward. So I found it useful. Other people may not. I've always, no matter, and look, I've worked with some very um, disturbed children, um, always had a cool down area, always had a place to go that was safe, that was comfortable, <coughs> but the understanding was it was very much only there for occasions when it was agreed you need to cool down. So we had a place that was acknowledged by everyone that was a cool down office and it was usually in my office. <laughs> usually in my office in the corner while writing out reports and again virtually just no communication, no sound, a very quiet place. Often the behaviour is risky. Uh, they want to be liked, they really want to be accepted and often it's inappropriate, it's overt, and not in their best interests. So we were very aware of um, having that sense of the circles of trust. I'm sure you have uh, mum and dad in the middle, siblings around you, and aunts and uncles, and then your next circle, neighbours, so And you have your circles that you draw out from and this is the behaviour for your inner circle, this is the behaviour with the second circle and this is your behaviour for your wider social group. And again it was rehearsed, it was very very clearly spelt out visually uh, that you just don't go up to a stranger <coughs> on a, a bus and hug them, not appropriate. But for grandma, yes, give grandma a great big hug. She'll give you a great big hug back. So stranger danger was more about appropriate social behaviours outside the safe family environment, the safe school environment. And that's a lifetime of training that's going to be needed. And this next one, <laughs> our kids are notorious swearers. Oh my gosh, I have had my vocabulary extended quite significantly since I've started this training. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and it just comes from nowhere. Uh, it's a sign often the anxiety levels are increasing, so they resort to the most inappropriate behaviour they can think of, and that's abs absolutely obscene language. Um, they are usually wanting to get attention in some cases. Oh yes, it gets everyone's attention. Uh, it's often a sign that they're not dealing, period. And it's time to really quiet place, let's see what's happening. That would be a basis of where I'd start. And I'd start gently, and I'd start to experiment <coughs> with different strategies. What works with one child may not work with another. Uh, and you would be talking together all the time because consistency is really important. There's no use doing it one way at school, different at home. You working together. There is no way you can manage Prada Lily syndrome by yourself. It takes a team to support you. And you've got to accept that that team each has an important role to play. But each person in that team has got to talk to each other and everyone's got to be concise, consistent and clear. That's my three C's.